This episode of Working is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, or in-depth discussions of craft and the creative process, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you... Understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Really immersive cinema isn't so much about having loads of sound or loud sound or sound flying around your head. It's about having sound you can believe in. In a sort of Marvel blockbuster, over-the-top kind of hyperbolic sound works really well. But in something like The Zone of Interest, it has to have a fragility to it. And that only comes from trying to do things for real and reenacting. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Isaac Butler. Isaac, it is always a thrill to talk to you, and it's been too long. It has been too long. Happy New Year, June. Thank you. Same to you. Hey, um, whose voice did we hear at the top of the show? That was the incredible sound designer for film, Johnny Byrne. And why did you want to speak with Johnny right now? Well, Johnny Byrne is one of the top sound designers in movies today. He actually has two films out right now. One is Poor Things, which we don't really talk about. The one that we do talk about is The Zone of Interest. And that, beyond being one of my favorite movies of the year, easily one of the greatest sound designs I've ever heard. And I wanted to talk to him and and, and know how he did it. It's also a very weird use of sound design because the point of the film is, you know, it's about the, the private life, the personal life of the commandant of Auschwitz during World War II oh. and his family. So you there's one movie that you watch, which is about this family going about their kind of mundane, actually weirdly idyllic life while their bureaucrat dad figures out how to gas you know, thousands of people. Mm-hmm. So that's the first film. And then there's a second film kind of underneath that film poking through, which is the sound of the camps, which are right on the other side of the wall from their house. And so that sound keeps invading the movie. And I was just very curious as to how he did that and how he thought about doing that. Whoa. Okay. I cannot wait to hear that conversation. But tell me, is there something extra for Slate Plus members? What will they hear? Yes. So we talked a bit about the challenges of mixing the zone of interest, because again, you have this foreground background thing. And how do you figure out how it fits in? You know, because it's not the only thing going on. And also the difference conceptually between how do you design a soundscape for a normal movie where we're sort of not meant to know that it's there, right? Versus one that's really, really present, like in this film. Well, okay. What a treat. If you're a member of Slate Plus, you'll hear that at the end of the episode. And if you aren't, well, it's really easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you get to hear extra segments on this show and others such as the Culture Gab Fest and Amicus. You get bonus episodes of podcasts like Slow Burn and Decodering. And of course, you'll never hit a paywall on Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. All right. Let's hear Isaac's conversation with Johnny Byrne. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. 
Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. Johnny Byrne, thank you so much for joining us on Working This Week to talk about your process. Hey, thank you. It's great to meet you, Isaac. So I believe I remember reading that you came to film sound design from like being a DJ or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about how you transitioned fields and just how you got into being a sound designer for film? So when I, in my teens, I was, um, I had a bedroom full of like, you know, electronic music equipment. And that was my kind of real super passion. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that you could get paid for doing anything like that. Went and did a degree in business studies and got quite depressed about after a term of that and quit. And, and a friend of mine said to me, hey, there's a job going at a recording studio in London. You know, you would love this. It, it, it works on films and commercials and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I, um, so I was, you know, making electronic music programming and DJing and not doing particularly well at any of that, but just enjoying it and had no idea that there was a whole industry that mm. did these things. Does that musical background kind of help you? Like, are you often thinking about the rhythms of sounds that you use or, you know, whatever it is? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, every sound, even non-musical sounds have an amount of musicality to them, right. you know, birds, obviously, but, but even a, a passing car has a rhythm and, a, you know, and footsteps in the street. It's unavoidable. And, and I think if you can uh, work that in when you're working, you know, a particularly, you know, a piece of art of film, then being aware of natural rhythms and melodies is, is really super useful. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, now, have you found that has the field must have changed a lot since then, right? With improvements in software and technological change since you started? Or does the job feel kind of pretty much the same? Wow. I mean, it's, it's changed so much. Yeah. I mean, on, on a sort of simple level, the first equipment I worked on had the ability to have 12 different tracks of audio at the same time, you know, and that 12 was, whole tracks. <laughs> 12 whole tracks and now i'm in like you know 1200 would not be unusual on a right. you know, big dolby atmos mix of a film so that alone but but and there's all sorts of clever software that will do things like remove noise you know if you if you recorded a cat in a street and you didn't like the sound of the mush of the background traffic you can now press a button and get rid of those things oh yeah which one do you use is that isotope or a yeah dialogue? isotope is yeah. is fantastic and there's a there's a dialogue one now called dx revive that that has um you know ai built in and so it will the process used to be i hear what you don't like and i'll try and remove it and now the process is i hear what you like i'll recreate just that bit without the bit you don't want in there which is sort of oh strange. wild that's so yeah. wild yeah i remember being in a mixing session for some voiceover for a project i was working on using isotope and i got to hear a track of just the actor spittle as it was removed <laughs> from the you know it just played through and i just heard all the mouth sounds that we were taking out it was like a little a little mini horror soundscape or something you see even know. that would have its own natural rhythm that would be a very it did it did it had a kind of like it, it, it had a sort of beatbox to it right <laughs> So we're here to mostly talk about uh, the zone of interest. I know you also uh, are represented in theaters very soon with Poor Things, but the zone of interest is the one that I was able to get into a screening of, so we're mostly going to be talking about that today. And if I remember correctly, that's your second film working with director Jonathan Glazer, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, uh, I did actually have a a smaller part on Birth, which was his 2003 feature, because basically I've I've known John for 25 years, I think Mm -hmm. we worked out last night, and The first thing I did with him was a a video for Uncle Rabbit in the Headlights with the guy walking down the tunnel getting smashed by the car continuously. Ninety-eight, I think that was. But um, so he then introduced me to the world of film because he, we love working together. So I, I kind of understood a bit more about how to transition from the kind of world of pop promos and commercials that I used to work on uh, through doing the film Birth. And, and so by the time Under the Skin came along in 2011, when it was kind of shot, that was um, my first film as, uh, you know, I'm in charge of the soundscape kind of thing. Right. And in the meantime, you've also worked with Jordan Peele on Nope. You've worked with Yorgos Lanthimos on several movies. Um, I mean, those are three very different directors aesthetically, right? I'm just curious about like how the creative process of working with the three of them is different. You know, what is that collaboration like and how does it change between those three artists? Absolutely. I mean, they are three very different directors. Right. So with Jonathan, he's he's absolutely all about you know, making the form of a piece to a process of elimination of kind of trying everything that may work and understanding what all the options may be and and working through together very much on a sort of daily basis for many months. 
trying to figure out how, you know, what the best uh, solution for the logical problems or whatever. And Yorgos is, um, you know, makes similarly extraordinary films. And, but with a, you know, a very different process where he, he says to me, basically, you're the sound designer, you do the sound <laughs> and play me it when you're kind of happy with it. And, um, and Jordan, I would say, is somewhere between the two. And he, um, it, when I worked with him on Nope, it was a script that he sent to me, you know, about a year before it was filmed. And it was brilliant. You know, he, he involved me in the process of, you know, writing out in the script where this monster would exist and, and how we would portray these unseen things. But, yeah, interestingly, both Jordan and Yorgos came to me because they were fans of Jonathan Glazer's Under the Skin. That's, right. that's you know, that was my calling card. So you mentioned that with Jonathan Glazer, you're meeting really frequently during the pre-production process. How long was that process of, of the two of you kind of thinking through the sound prior to him even shooting anything? Oh, my God. I mean, so, you know, I talked to John a lot anyway, and I think it was probably a couple of years before filming that he first said to me, I, you know, here's a script. This is very the beginnings of it. And, and you know, let's figure out what to do because... Uh, you know, basically I panicked. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, this film has enormous responsibility in sound, not only because the sound is going to deliver such a huge part of the film and and we're not even going to get to put that on until we've finished filming it. And, you know, so the whole leap of faith of getting through production and editing the picture before putting the sound on. And and also obviously the responsibility of the of the content of the material, of, of being respectful to the victims and and getting that right, basically, you know, representing the sound of mass murder. Right, right. For our listeners who don't know, The Zone of Interest is a film about the kind of day-to-day life of the commandant of Auschwitz. And so we see his kind of idyllic family life and, and somewhat dull bureaucratic life while literally just off camera or sometimes in the background of a shot, mass murder is taking place. And that world is entirely summoned, almost entirely summoned into the film via your sound design, right? So that does sound like a mammoth undertaking kind of both emotionally and creatively um what were your early parts of the process where did you just start annotating the script or did you read the novel or you know what are you doing first yeah absolutely research i mean it was all about you know so i i I read many novels and you know there's much literature on the matter but it was more about um okay we need to know everything about every single sound that would have been in Auschwitz in that period of time and, and kind of the physicality of how it would have been heard in the, in the space of the camp, you know, coming over the wall. And, and so, uh, yeah, I think the first six months were just um, reading, the bulk of it was reading witness testimony. You know, there, there is a lot, you know, available and understanding what happened there. And I made this kind of 600-page document of, like, all the different birds and the bees and, you know, and to make a film set sound correct, you know, the, the right passing cars in the road so that we had period specific traffics and the planes that flew overhead would be the the ones that were accurately correct so recording all those things and but more importantly the witness testimony of the atrocities that happened and understanding how to recreate sounds that would be over heard from over the wall that were accurate and, and respectful to the content Got it. And so how are you figuring out what the sounds of the the camps are? Is that literally people in their witness testimony mention something sonic and you write it down? Or was it through consulting with historians or like, I mean, some of it is like, obviously there's gunshots, obviously not to be grim about it, but there's a furnace that's very active in the movie. Right. But there's also the, I don't know, people working because it was also a labor camp, but there's the sounds of that. And, you know, how did you develop that in a way that was specific and not general? Yeah, I mean, all of the above, really, because it was such an enormous task. You know, it was a year of my team and I going out and recording sound and from all different sources. So understanding, you know, through reading all the witness testimony, and that would be the guards, at, you know, at the Nuremberg trial or, or subsequently much testimony and also from victims and victims, survivors, families. And and yeah, absolutely. When When anything mentioned, you know, a scenario that happened, I would write it down and that would be something that we would recreate either through a reenactment with actors outside or or through um hanging out in places where people scream and shout and and you know like parks and you know the reaper barn in berlin at night and uh you know just going to places over a period of a year uh, through different european cities and recording all the different um, variety of 
foreign voices that we needed to represent the different nationalities in the camp and all sorts of different places to get sound that was credible, basically. That's wild. So it isn't just, you know, you have a closet full of hard drives with, you know, woman screaming, high pitched, <laughs> woman screaming, low pitch. You're actually going out and getting actors together and recreating stuff and then recording it and using it. Yeah. So those sounds that were women scream one, women scream version two, they do exist. Right. But when you put them on a film that is a sort of documentary feel as the zone of interest, they they sound bad, you know, they sound like fake. And so yeah, absolutely we we had um, you know, twenty people and we put them in wooden clogs and walked them across a car park in Poland and, you know, in shuffling and tied their legs together and we you know, so a lot of things like that, you know, many different. And we we had a train carriage and we disembarked people from the train. So we had the sound of people being pushed around inside a wooden box and those things. And, and, and actors, and we would take them outside to spaces that had the kind of right building concrete reflective surfaces so that things sound correct. And And we had to do a lot of research to understand the difference between someone pretending to be in pain and someone actually being in pain, which... You would think, I mean, if, if I said to you, say, ah, like you're in pain, it tends right. to be people go, ah, and they sort of fall off at the end of it when they're faking it. And if you're actually in pain, you don't. You go, ah, and whack. And that's so understanding the difference between real and fake and that was what led us to having more success with our sort of eighth go with actors and that kind of thing. Wow. And then you also mentioned, you know, period specific, having the correct car engine sounds, having the correct plane engine sounds. Uh, most of those cars and planes are not with us any longer, you know, because this uh, movie takes place in the, in the 40s. So, so how did you get those correct sounds? So, yeah, I mean, again, more research. I mean, so there's a guy in Estonia who has a collection of World War II German motorbikes. I mean, he became incredibly useful. And, and uh, one of my guys went over there and he also had this, um, hilariously, he had this Alsatian that would, every time we were trying to record, he would chase the motorbike up and down the road that we were on. And so he, that, the dog actually made it into the movie as well from the really? motorbike. That's amazing. Do you always do your own Foley? Are you always like making your own sound effects for the most part when you work on movies? Yeah, it's impossible not to because, um, so Jonathan and I really realized like years ago that actually really immersive cinema isn't so much about having loads of sound or loud sound or sound flying around your head. It's about having sound you can believe in, the, the credibility of it. And it's, it's really hard to fool the human ear. You know, we're so, in, in a sort of Marvel blockbuster type film, absolutely, you know, um, big, powerful, crunchy, over the top kind of hyperbolic sound works really well. But, but in something like the zone of interest, it has to be, there's, it has to have a fragility to it and, and a sort of um, a sensitivity. And, and that only comes from going and trying to do things for real and reenacting basically, whatever it is. You mentioned the kind of immense leap of faith of doing all of this work and then kind of waiting for the movie to be shot and then trying to layer it in. But, Surely you were communicating what these sound ideas were to Jonathan before he's going and, and filming, right? Like, does was there an impact between kind of the sound design ideas and how the movie wound up being filmed? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, John and I always discussed it as there being two films, film one being the film you see and film two being the film you hear. Right. And remarkably, those two didn't actually meet until post-production, you know, until about six months into the picture edit. And so, you know, I was talking to Sandra Huller and Christian, the actors, and mm -hmm. they were absolutely stunned when they saw the film for the first time because, of course, when they were acting, they, they heard none of the, of the sound that we put on from over the wall, and nor should they have because the whole point was, you know, they were willfully ignorant. Right. So, yeah, it, it was... Um, John said, I'm going to go and film this, and, and in the meantime, you go and you know, do your, basically you, your own shoot of all the sound that you're going to need for your film that has no pictures. Right. Now, now there is, of course, also the other side of the film, which are the brief, I don't know, should we call them fairy tale sequences? I, I sort of don't know. Yeah. What, what was your, is that what you called them in the... Well, we just call them the night vision, or, or the girl is called Alusia. The, got it, got the, it. In the night vision stuff, yeah. And that's a very different sonic environment. Can you talk a little bit about creating that? Absolutely. There's... um. So yeah, this is a, a sequence in the film where it's actually a true story that John met the woman, Alexandra, who 
sadly passed away last year, but she was uh, 93 when John met her a couple of years ago. And she told him the story of how she would hide apples. She was a local Polish girl and she would hide apples in, in the quarry pits where the prisoners would be taken to do their work detail for the day. So this was an extraordinarily benevolent act within a film that there is nothing else like that. And, and it was filmed at night. And, you know, John certainly felt the only way to kind of represent this was, again, natural light. And, and this um, incredible uh, military night vision camera was employed to give us the extraordinary detail that we see. But the, the significant thing is that the whole film, when you're in the camp and when you're in the, you know, the, the commander's house and the family drama, as we called it, there's a production sound mixer, Tarn Villas, spent an enormous amount of time miking up hidden microphones in the house so that um, what we were really after was that the, the film should have the sound of people in a house rather than hearing their dialogue really nice and clean. It was about hearing their footsteps and their clunks and bumps around the house. And it's, so it's very much observational. Yet this bit, the, the night vision bit, it, is completely the opposite. It's really POV. It's very much you are absolutely with her. You hear her breath. And um, so you're, it's an extraordinarily different part of the film for various um, logical and artistic reasons. We'll be back with more of Isaac's conversation with Johnny Byrne. If you like using debit over credit, don't you think it's time to also get rewarded? Well, now you can with Discover Cashback Debit. It's a checking account that rewards everyone with cashback on everyday purchases. Plus, you're not charged any account fees, period. Whether you're moving, starting a new job or headed into that next stage of life, whatever it is, Discover Cashback Debit is for everyone. Check out eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Maybe you finally organized one part of your space and you want to tackle another. Or maybe you're taking your supplements every morning and now you want to actually eat breakfast too. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. Look, I've been open on this show about going to see a therapist. I, I've been in and out of therapy for 20 years. I have personally found it incredibly helpful. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, maybe you want to give better help a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash working today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash working. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we offer advice about creative dilemmas. So please tell us your creative challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Isaac's conversation with Johnny Byrne. You know, I, I was just recalling that one of the things, how do I put this? It, it's a movie that has to train its audience in how to watch it, right? Uh, and I, <laughs> yeah. I assume that, I, I don't know if you and Jonathan Glazer talked about that, but it does very much feel like, you know, that that opening in the credits where there's just a really long time with just a color yeah, wash on screen. Yeah. It says, right, and then the first scene is this, there's this long, still, incredibly detailed shot with all of these environmental sound effects, right? I mean, you know, you really, it feels like you're really trying to teach the audience, like, this is a thing that has different rules than what you're used to and we're just going to make sure you know what they are so that you can then just like watch the fucking movie then that's exactly how it works i mean the, yeah so the, the opening three and a half minutes of the film are an overture in darkness you, the title lands of the film and that fades away the title was actually f- filmed with the same night vision camera the, the the zone of interest was was made in metal heated up filmed and and as you see it cooling we go into darkness and 
and and you sit there for three minutes and and you know and obviously some people think wow has the projector broken but the point was you know slow down relax put your bag down take your coat off you know have a sip of the drink you know and get get ready because this is going to be different and we're just going to take you back in time and chill and 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 then bang and you land in in um 1943 and Mm -hmm. you're by a lake in in Poland and 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 yeah, and you hear this amazing, beautiful bird, and, and and the whole of that definitely has the consequence of use your ears, and which is extraordinary because the whole film is is about saying sort of, well, I know that you can shut your eyes, but you can't shut your ears, so why can't these people hear what I'm hearing? You know, it's, it's, right? Yeah. What was the most complicated or challenging part of the soundscape for you to create? Goodness me, I think undoubtedly the sequence where. Rudolf Hoss stands in his garden at night having a cigar whilst over the garden wall there are people being gassed to death in the in the chamber you know like 100 feet away and and knowing that we you know had to represent that because it was you know an an important part the whole way through the film the the challenge was um being representative accurately and and having you know enough sound to to reflect the enormous amount of death and murder that, that mm. happened there, yet no, not wanting to sensationalize anything or, you know, cross that line. So and that's such a hard balance, particularly with works of art that are about the Shoah, right? It's like it's so hard to do that thing of like paying homage to it, not mm-hmm. sensationalizing it. It is something that is grandiose in scale, right? But you can't approach it with grandiosity. It's it's very tricky. Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I think. That was why it was mandatory for director Jonathan to never go inside the camp. You know, we, right. we, we will not show the violence. Yet, you know, for me, it's the most violent film I've ever worked on, you know. And, and, and we were using the, um, the collective mental imagery, well, the collective knowledge that we all have of what happened there. You know, everyone has read stories. And, and we were using that knowledge to kind of draw, draw pictures in people's head based on, you know, the sound that they're hearing. Wow. Wow. And, um, you mentioned earlier Dolby Atmos, which I think, you know, we, we should talk a little bit about the mixing of the film, right? Cause part of what's going on is the sounds are layered and they're extremely directional, right? So you might, I mean, there's the dialogue and then you might have something far off on the left and then closer on the left and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. Can you just talk a bit about the mixing that, that kind of mixing process and, and placing the sounds and in the environment and, yeah, totally. We, we, I mean, the whole thing was, you know, we, we wanted it to be right. So I approached, initially, the mix was just hugely scientific. I, you know, I had an enormous map that I made, you know, big A3 paper with understanding exactly where everything was in Auschwitz and, and knowing the distances and, and the physics of how sound atrophies across distance and the tonality of things so that, you know, uh, something uh, 100 feet away will have less bass and less sort of treble in it. That It's sort of a more mid rangey sound and understanding where all the different surfaces are. So I had reverb units that would reflect the sound off, you know, the the commander's block or the house or, you know, the voices. So it was all about understanding where where things would be and and for the most part we recorded things at the accurate distance that they were like the when you hear a volley of shots that's representative of the execution block block 11 which was about 140 yards away and so we recorded the guns at that distance oh wow but, um, and so you're also getting some of the decay of that sound naturally right it's not crisp it's a little you get whatever's in between yeah yeah absolutely and and you hear it and, uh, you know, with all the ricochets of it bouncing around the, the different walls that are, you know, Auschwitz was a, a cavern of, of different brick buildings. That, right. Yeah, so things would sound very sort of strange and unusual at distance, which I think really played in and sort of helped with this idea of, am I hearing the kids laughing? You know, was that scream the, the eight-year-old girl laughing in the garden or was it a prisoner? You know, there's right. a lot of that. You know, I love this because, you know, I'm, I'm mostly a nonfiction writer. And so the interplay between research and creativity is something I'm, you know, very, very fond of talking to people about. <laughs> you know, it seems like the rigor with which you approached the sort of non-fictional aspect of the sound design was like actually a very generative thing for you that like a lot of ideas came from that decision you made to try to make the sound as kind of real and accurate as possible. Yeah, absolutely. It influenced everything. The, um, in, in fact, the, you know, some of the, the film sequences became 
some of the sort of narrative uh, beats became born out of the soundscape in, in, through its reality. Like um, the shot of the young boy looking out the window and hearing his father on a horse and uh, abusing a prisoner. And, um, and then the boy sort of turns around from the curtain and says, don't do that again. That was actually a shot that, that was um, used for a different purpose. And, hmm. and uh, we decided that, that that could be useful to have a whole entire sound narrative that, that, that happened outside the window that tied in Lucia's apple hiding with, with a prisoner being caught with an apple. And the consequence of that for him was death by drowning in the river. And so for that, we, we um, had Christian, the, the lead actor. And, and to get that exactly right, and for me to know that it had to be accurate, um, and the insurance company didn't like this, but I wanted Christian back on a horse as, you know, so I could record him clopping around and knowing that his diaphragm would work differently if he's sitting on a And it would just all sound correct if we did that. So, yeah, absolutely. It was um, influenced everything we did. So obviously, you know, anyone who goes to see movies in the in the cinema knows that it's a very different experience than being at home, you know, particularly actually the 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 sonic arrangement. Most people do not have a Dolby Atmos uh, system in their apartment or whatever. Do you think about that much with the design? You know, you hear about like uh, record producers or whatever playing the album on shitty speakers and then in the car and then in the studio to hear kind of how it sounds. Do you do you think about that in sound design? Yeah, you have to democratize it somewhat to the kind of lowest common denominator. And in fact, for you know, there are two different mixes. There is a theatrical mix, and and there is the home end or domestic mix, as it's called. So, if you are watching on like a streaming service with Five One, and you have and you have a, a home setup, then it will automatically select the kind of theatrical mix. But but for the most part, if you're watching on your iPad or whatever, then, then what you get is a version that. I've listened to on an iPad and I've, I've mixed it, you know, in a big mixing room with a cinema screen in front of me and I'm just hearing it out of an iPad. And so, yeah, it, the, the crucial quiet sounds get a little boost. And, mm-hmm. and the, I think the, you know, so yeah, it, it, it is adjusted for that. The, the most significant thing I think that would be probably more unusual is the sort of, is the score that happens over dark screen. If you're watching that, you know, to be, sitting in a cinema and, and surrounded by people and all in darkness is, is a very extraordinary and strange experience and just to listen. Yet I would imagine if, you know, if you're on a bus going to Clapham and you are watching a black screen with some music, you might think it feels a bit different. Does it hurt your soul a little bit to watch the film on a big screen and hear it coming out of a tiny iPad speaker? No, it's awful. It's a terrible <laughs> thing. It's like a sacrilege you feel oh gotta do it and you know can't we just say that it can only be watched in a cinema right that doesn't work these days no no but then you know but then i i also have faith in i know you know big tvs in homes are are pretty standard nowadays right so right so here's hoping people a lot of people get to hear it well amazing do you take breaks between projects and if you do you know what do you do to recharge when a film's over I'm so looking forward to going skiing. And, you skiing? Know, I've, I've, oh, I've, interesting. Yeah, I, I, I love um, snowboarding and, and uh, family time more than anything. I have two teenage children and oh, I amazing. need to get back home and see them. Yeah, totally. Do you find that being a... Now, you, you transitioned into sound design when you were pretty young, but do you feel like it's shaped the way you kind of interact with the world? Like when you're on that skiing trip, is there like a part of your brain that's like... Oh, the icy snow has this more trebly sound than the crunchiness of the the non icy yeah. snow. Or you know, can, is it just all the time you kind of taking in stimulus and thinking about it? Yeah, inevitably, I I take a microphone on holiday with me. I I was caused to to really see the benefit of sound when I was seventeen. I I was going to go out for a run and I I stuck a, a large Evian plastic water bottle under the tap in in, in my house in London and. And I turned the tap on and I went away and I forgot about it. And when I came back an hour later, the, I was like, oh, I forgot, I left that bottle there. But why is the water only halfway full up the bottle? And, you know, why is the tap not running? And as I put my hand to touch it, it was filled with London ring main pressure of, you know, air and water. And this bottle exploded in my face. And I was profoundly deaf, 100%. Um, you know, so it was like a, you know, shell shock bomb blast thing or whatever. But... I was completely deaf and I, and I was like, oh my God. And I, couldn't, and I was rubbing my fingers in my ears and going, what the hell? And then I went into my bedroom and I played some sound through the speaker really loud and I could feel it 
w- bobbling, but I couldn't hear a thing. And I was, I was like, oh my God, I've killed my ears, I'm deaf. And uh, about 20 minutes later, very slowly, my hearing started to come back to normal or, or near normal. I know that there's a tiny bit that I blew out at that point, but, but, um, but yeah, it was extraordinary. And so I've always been incredibly grateful for, for hearing ever since that point. And, and yeah, definitely when, whenever I go anywhere, I always have a little microphone that I can plug into my phone, into, into an iPhone and, and record things, much to the annoyance of my wife. <laughs> Do field recording? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, this is a lovely beach when we're in a romantic moment. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. My hand on the sand sounds like this, right? <laughs> the, did, did you find that that experience of very temporarily losing your hearing and having it gradually come back has affected how you approach sound design? You know, like those kind of sounds coming back in layers or, you know, noticing sound in a different way? Well, I was so adrenalinely stressed. That moment is absolutely burned into my head and memory. And yeah, no, I, I whenever... It's such a powerful thing, silence in cinema. You know, you really are forcing people to to think about something very differently. And yeah, and and so I I certainly know how to do the the, the bit where the sound comes back in. (laughs) Right, like in Oppenheimer, right? When you cut, when the the bomb drops and the sound goes out, you're like, oh, the sound's gone out. Yeah, no, that's the real shit now. Yeah. I saw in your bio that the sound of a phone ringing in Skype is actually <laughs> your voice. Is that true? How did that happen? Did yeah. they hire you to be like, you know, Brian Eno did the Windows 95 sound. We need you <laughs> to do the ringing Skype sound. Or did you just know someone who worked at Skype? Or like, how did that well, come no, about? So it came back because uh, this friend of mine, Peter Rayburn, who's a music producer and composer, he he knew the guys who were, worked in the same street as my studio and so this was lexington street in soho and whenever it was uh 20 2001 or three two i can't remember anyway we um we went and saw them because they said can you come around we're, we're starting this phone thing and we were like great and we went and had a chat and they showed us how the internet phone worked and we were like this will never catch on are you mad <laughs> and uh this is you know this is long before iphones and right. anyway and, and they just gave us a, a list of all the sounds that they needed like a the hang up was a boom, and the the login sound is me and this guy Pete and whoever else was in the studio that day going sky and uh yeah and and the phone ring was was me going and you know and you just sort of play with it with a plug in a little bit and mess around and Pete made some um you know musical synthesizer st- stuff to to add to that. That's wild. That's wild. So I've actually been hearing your voice for like 20 years and not, uh, and not realizing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Johnny Byrne, thank you so much for coming on Working to talk about your process. I, I learned so much and it was just really fascinating. So thank you. It has been such an honor and a pleasure to talk. Thank you so much, Isaac. Up next, Isaac and I will talk about how writers can incorporate sound into their creative practice and how to decide when you've done enough research and preparation. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, You call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast, It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. 
Isaac, that was a fantastic interview. It's one of those situations where I know I'll be listening to TV shows and movies and even Skype sound effects in a slightly different way from now on. Isn't um, that amazing that he's the Skype sound, that the do is just him? That is definitely the craziest thing I've heard all year, and I'm now low-key <laughs> obsessed. Uh, when we record working, I become hyper aware that my desk chair is a little squeaky. I'm going to just... Oh, see, now I'm trying to make it squeak. It's not doing it. Um, it's a sound that it doesn't really enter my consciousness at any other time of the week. But because we're recording, I guess I'm really listening out for it. Recently, you led an episode of Working Overtime with the title, How Sense Memory Exercises Can Improve Your Art. I recommend that episode to listeners who are now thinking about all the sounds we aren't typically conscious of. But I wonder, could you give us a sense of some of the ways you use sound in your writing process, even like now when you're writing a book about visual art and the politics of culture? In other words, something that doesn't necessarily involve sound the same way your book about method acting did. That's a really good question. You know, the first art form I learned to do was music. I was a pianist, uh, or I wasn't a pianist. I was a five-year-old who took piano lessons, but you know what I mean. You know, I played yeah. piano and I played drums and I sang and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. And so I definitely think about musicality. Maybe you've had this too, that, you know, one of the challenges as a historian is bringing a scene or a room or a moment to life. And sound is incredibly useful for that, but it's really hard to get that information, what sounds were going on in that room at that time. I was very lucky with the method in that there were tons of memoirs that people had written. And of course, in their memory, their sounds, and they talk about those sounds. Oh, you know, wow. Stanislavski was really obsessed with sound. So sound is all over his memoirs and his scripts and stuff. And so, so like I was able to use those. It, it is a real challenge in the current one that I'm writing. But I do think about the sound of a sentence all the time. I read my stuff out loud all the time. You know, anytime I'm turning something in, whether it's a, a draft or a revision or whatever, I'm usually reading it out loud. I read my the method out loud probably a dozen times over the course of writing wow. and revising it. Um, and, and I definitely think about the sounds of individual words, how they play together in a sentence, how rhythm works. That for me is really important. But yes, if you do stumble upon an account or an interview where someone mentions a sonic detail. It's like circle it, <laughs> make sure you know that it's there and then use them whenever possible. I mean, are, are you having that experience? You know, when you're trying to bring, I don't know, a lesbian bar to life, it's like what was on the jukebox playing in the background or the clink of glasses or, you know, whatever it is. You know, I wish I could say I had. Every time we have a conversation similar to this, I think, oh, yeah, I got to do that more. And it, it just it doesn't come naturally to me. You know, even the thing that you talked about reading your book, you've said that before, that you read it out loud. And I always think, oh, that's such a great idea. I should do that. And then I kind of fade out after a few paragraphs. It just seems... <laughs> it's like, tiring. Oh, and in my, yeah. And my book is not particularly long. It's not a long book. but And it's not because I get bored. It's just because I think, Oh, I don't know if this is really helping me anymore. Right. So this is something I really want to work on more because everything you just said, I just want to, it just makes me go, yeah, yeah, oh my God, yes. But I don't kind of do it naturally. Well, I think also what's important there to say as well, and it's true of any advice we give on this show, is like it either works for you or it doesn't. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you, yeah. you fading out after reading a few paragraphs may actually be your mind telling you something, which is like, yeah. actually, this isn't useful for me in my process. And that's not how I'm going to get to good writing. And that's totally yeah. fine. It's not like every writer should do yeah. it. It's just, that's what I feel like embodying the words in that way helps me figure out something. I can't even put my finger on it about how they yeah. go together. Yeah. But you know, the thing is that I think sometimes I definitely read it internally. You know, I, I hear the words in my head and I sometimes think that I rely too much on my, the way that I vocalize it, you know, how, how I would perform it to the world. And that actually other people I know from when I ask, you know, my partner to read, she doesn't hear it the same way. So I am doing it just not out loud, which mm. is weird. Get Rosemary to read it to you. That's that's the key <laughs> is uh, press gang your partner into reading it to you and uh, then uh, take notes. Um, I'm glad that you asked Johnny Byrne to what extent he expects or even wants viewers and listeners to be aware of his work. Mm -hmm. I am reminded of the FX series, The Americans, where the scenes that were set in the Soviet Union were shot on a different kind of film stock. I don't know how many viewers noticed that. I but noticed the showrunners, that. 
Oh, well, good for you. I knew you would. Uh, the, but the showrunners and the studio felt it made enough of a difference to spend money on it. And sometimes when I'm watching something and I become aware of something that an actor's doing, even if it's something I'm impressed by, I wonder if it's bad that I'm noticing it. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't the artifice supposed to fall away? I am guessing that this is something you've thought about. What's your preference for the balance between focusing on the art and awareness of the work that went into it? I think it is totally dependent project to project, artist to artist. To give an example, I recently wrote a piece for The New Yorker on the work of Nick Cage. Oh, and, Nick Cage, and, and by the way, that was an amazing piece. I, oh, thank was... you so much. I know he's read it because he's mentioned it twice in interviews, once uh, positively and once he dunked on me. So, you know, maybe he <laughs> likes it, maybe he doesn't. Um, but, you know, Cage is a perfect example of this because there are performances in which he disappears into the role. Mm. Michael Sarnowski's film Pig is a great recent example where he really vanishes into the role. And then there's performances where the artifice is part of the point, like Dream Scenario, the director of whom I actually interviewed for an earlier episode of Working, uh, in which the level of artifice is part of the point because the character mm. is a little affected. He's not actually comfortable in his own skin. Yeah. And so it really, really, really depends on the project. I will say the interesting thing about Zone of Interest is that the sound design is very present, but you're not thinking the whole time, huh, I wonder if the guy who did this came up with a 900-page research document and then staged <laughs> yeah. all of these incidents yeah. and then pointed a microphone exactly 100 feet away from them and recorded it. You're not thinking about that. Yeah. You're just like, oh, yeah. shit, there's this wild thing going on with the sound. I think, though, if I'm being honest, it's a very American thing, maybe, but, you know, the gut preference is, of course, for work that is, quote unquote, invisible. And part of being older or something is learning to appreciate more work that is deliberately visible. The problem I have is when work is visible in spite of itself. Um, to give a recent yeah. example, I think, you know, like Leonardo DiCaprio in Killers of the Flower Moon is an embarrassingly terrible performance because he he's judging the character and showing you all the work he did to make himself into this despicable person instead of just being a despicable person, which would be so yeah. much more compelling and dangerous and so much more implicating of the audience. Yeah, well... Um, you mentioned some of the research that Johnny Byrne did for the Zone of Interest. I mean, recreating Auschwitz's exact dimensions and surfaces in order to create an authentic sound. I mean, at one point he talked about recording a particular element in a parking lot in Poland and that in Poland <laughs> just got to be. I mean, it's an amazing commitment to authenticity and... Obviously, going to those lengths added to the movie's cost. And I really respect director Jonathan Glazer and the film's producers for, you know, going to those lengths, spending that money. But for those of us working in less collaborative industries, in book writing, for example, an advance is effectively a budget that the writer is in charge of. Do you have any tips about spending priorities, Isaac? What is the thing you most wish you could do but currently don't feel you can afford? I would say that the thing that I, to answer the second one first, the thing that mm. I wish I could do but can't afford is have a personal assistant. Mm. You know? Well, I mean, who yes. wouldn't want a personal assistant if they could afford it? And a home Pilates instructor. I'll do those two <laughs> things. But but one of them helps with writing and the other does not. Um, I'll uh, do that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I that's the thing I would definitely do because, you know, the logistics and the paperwork... Yeah, pile up, yeah. you know, Tuesday, I spent all morning Tuesday just arranging interviews over email, you know, and yeah. like, it would yeah. have been nice to have someone else do that so that I could read a book, right? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing that I would say about setting a budget based on the advance is that the advance is never going to cover everything that you need while writing the book. Because yeah. one of the things you need to do while writing the book is uh, be sheltered and eat food. And, you know, advances are smaller and smaller and smaller. And unless you're like yeah. a really big time writer, it's just not going to cover it, right? Yeah. So to me, the thing you have to figure out in budgeting is actually how am I going to make up the difference between this advance and what I need to live? That's really the important question. And it often means taking on freelance work, teaching, mm -hmm. applying for grants, which, you know, I'm applying for grants right now, mm -hmm. all sorts of things like that to really cover that time. The other thing, and this is for listeners who, who aren't in the industry and might not know this, is that advance payments are, are split up 
in three or sometimes four payments. So when you read about someone getting, I'm going to make up a number here, $300,000 for a book, you know, keep in mind that $300,000 is split up over four years, right? And at least, uh, at least, and agents and taxes take a significant percentage of it. So it Mm -hmm. actually probably at the end of the day comes out to 30 to $40,000 a year, right? Yeah. So those numbers are, it always ends up being smaller than you think it's going to be. And so you really have to be conservative. That's my advice. You really have to be conservative and you really have to figure out how am I going to make up the other money that I need to live? Yeah. I also want to recommend uh, anybody who just, whose ears perked up uh, in Isaac's answer just then, really great episode of Working Overtime about anchor jobs. Really mm-hmm. recommend that people check that out. Listeners, we hope you've enjoyed the show. If you have, please remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. That way you will never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on several Slate shows, and you will never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thank you to Johnny Byrne and to our wonderful producer, Cameron Drews, who always makes us sound good. You really have no idea. We'll be back next (laughs) week with June's conversation with children's book author Mika Song. Until then, get back to work.